Okay. Good afternoon, one and all. I welcome you all to the uh, second session of the second day of our ICT Blani 2. Uh, in this session, uh, we call it as semantics, and the session will be chaired by Dr. Lehavrambam Sarbajit Singh. And in this session, we have earlier five papers, but one of the papers has dropped because of some personal reason. So now uh, we are going to have four papers in this session. So uh, for the, uh, you know, for uh, to start or to begin the session, I invite Dr. L. Sarbajit Singh. Over to you, Dr. Sarbajit. Thank you, Bijan. Good afternoon and welcome all the presenters of today's session, as well as the participants. For this session, uh, Bijan already was announced the names. So, first paper will be uh, from Nisa Paul and Monali. The topic is classifiers in DILU. Please, Monali and Nisa Paul. Thank you, Dr. Sarbajit. And um, allow, kindly allow me to share my screen. Okay. Is it visible to all in full screen mode? Yeah, yeah, it's. Okay, so uh, Nisha, you pr proceed with the first few slides. Yes, ma'am. Are you all hearing me? Yeah. Am I audible? All yes, of yes, yes. Good afternoon, everyone present here. I am Nisha Paul. Our paper focuses on the classifiers in the loop and it is a dialect of machine language. Next. Yeah. Machine language, also known as Miri, belongs to Eastern Tani group of Tibeto-Burman language family. The language is mostly spoken in the state of Assam and in few places of Arunachal Pradesh. According to the census 2011, the population is approximately 7 lakhs. And based on the UNESCO report, missing is vulnerably endangered language. The language has nine dialects, Dalu, Pagro, Oyang, Sajang, Moi, Tambu, and Sambogria and Tamargoja and Bongkul have large shift towards the Assamese. Next. Next. Yeah, please wait. Uh, here the map showing the missing speaker region on the eastern part of Assam, Dalu is mainly spoken. Next. Next slide. Um, the data are being collected from the informant one. Telephonic recording has been taken and recorded. And uh, from the informant to all other cultural informants are being extracted. Our analysis is based on elicited text that consists uh, consisting 200, 250 words, 100 phrases, and 30 sentences approximately. Next slide, please. Yeah. The definition given in Crystal, a morpheme whose function is to indicate the formal or semantic classes to which items belong, is sometimes called a classifier. Based on knowledge on used for classification as male and female. And according to Akinwal 2006, uh, there are uh, Noun, numeral, positive location. Dalu has numeral classifier based on animacy, shape, and size properties. 
uh, thus it has sorted and mature classifier and uh, there has been a previous work on classifiers in missing by mark post and shirt kumar dole the only difference uh, between our paper and mark post and shirt kumar dole's paper is that they have focus on missing language in general focusing on dalu elaborating on its dialect and um, elaborating on its semantic and morphosyntactic properties next slide please So basically, the decimal system of missing language is quite interesting, as uh, we can see that a is prefixing the root word and forming a new numeral from one to six. One, when a is prefixed and become one into one, and result as one. Also, a as one is prefixing me. That is to um, is uh, is elaborating uh, as one into two and forms two, and also a as in one prefixing the unit three as um productive. It is one to three is three, and we can see and the further things and so on. Where and we can see that from seven and further numerals, a is not been prefixed. It it stands basically. Like as kanid, pini, konang, and really it is four into two, and it forms eight. Next slide, please. Yeah. While uh, we can see that ten, that the uh, the numeral ten, that is in. So it is being suffixed. The ing it is being suffixed with the root word ko, and uh, a numeral eleven, which is basically one plus ten, that is ko plus ing, forming eleven. And secondly, two plus ten is twelve, and three plus ten is thirteen, and this goes on. While we can see that forming the tens, uh, as is for twenty. The ten is multiplied with two. That is, <clears throat> that is, ing multiplied by ni forming twenty. While in the case of hundred, it is a uh, hundred is ling and ko is one. So to form hundred, it is hundred into one. That is ling ko, and to form hundred and two, it is hundred into one and. One into two, that is linear co. So now I would like to hand over the presentation to Ma'am Munali. Okay, thank you, Nisha. And um, because of the network disruption, what she was seeing was that the classifiers that we are focusing on is Dilu elaborating the semantic and morphosyntactic properties. That was what we are specifying here. So, um, like Nisha has showed the uh, has shown the. Decimal system of um, the Lu machine, and um, there are the there is a there is an R prefix, and there is also the co from one which gets suffixed, and we're going to look at its uh, uniqueness in the coming slides. So um, the classifiers in um, the Lu are uh, quantified with nouns, and they are prefixed as. Uh, these are just some of the samples among the many of them. So uh, the ones that we are going to focus for this presentations uh, for this presentation are uh, peer, board, door, so and p. So peer is used for um, animals and plant objects, basically small objects. Bore is used for flat objects, and door is for long and big objects that includes animate and concrete. And so for cylindrical objects, both animate and concrete, and p is for um, Anything round or having curves, um, any any kind of oval objects, anything like like that. So if we look at the uh, classifier P, it is occurring with um, uh, the nouns, as in uh, which can be categorized in terms of worms or invertebrates and insects, birds, aquatic fishes, and plants and seeds. So we can see that um, for leeches and caterpillars, um, P occurs in the quantification as Tapat uh, pirumko as three leeches and tayop pirumko, 
three hairy caterpillars. And it also occurs with the cockroaches and butterflies as insects, um, Staxil pirpico and Popir pirpico. So same way it occurs with the birds like parrots and sparrows. And um, for aquatic fishes, we have taken um, prawns and eels um, because um, the informant gave us just these two um, items only. And for seeds, we have um, coriander seed and mustard seed and any other seeds can be quantified and used with peer. Uh, bore occurs with all the flat objects that includes uh, plates, uh, books, leaves, and hand fans or anything that is flat. So for example, aram bore umku, three plates, and kitab bore piko, four books. Um, door is uh, quite interesting because it occurs with animate forms and um, animate, but they are supposed to be round or big. Uh, so it can occur with uh, plus young and plus adult and also with um, the other in invertebrates also. So uh, what is interesting is that um, snakes are also considered to be big and round. So basically snakes have small and large sizes. So for those which are large in size or for those eels which are large in size, they use door because um, so is also used for them, but this so is in terms of height. So so is used for long and cylindrical objects and um, as in snakes or eels or sticks and hair strands or even plants. So uh, for Long thin objects, we have given example of um, say three sharp sticks, which is Jamburok Sokomiko, and three chili plants as Mercy Among Sokomiko. And also for trees, um, Isung So in Niko, and tools as well as in uh, axes and hammers because they are long and cylindrical. So Igung So Piko. For the P classification, we have seen it occurring with um, basically. Um, items which are round, but not exactly round. For example, foods can be oval or it can be pentagonal, it can be any shape, but basically there is some kind of roundness in shape. So uh, four bananas have a P as in Kopak Pipiko and uh, two mangoes is Kedi Pimiko. And um, eggs are oval in shape and balls are round, but it, and it also has the same way of occurrence as in five eggs is Apu P Amoko and two balls is Bol Pimiko. Uh, the containers can also have um, the P occurring provided they are round and um, they're kind of, um, this is a jar and this is a bowl. So this is without the cover and this is with the cover. So it can occur with uh, both kind of entities. So two water jars is in Tekeli Piniko and two bowls is Bati Piniko. Um, however, for humans and for human nouns, uh, there is no such uh, classifiers uh, to count them. Instead, uh, the co from the numeral one is individuated for all the humans or the human nouns, whether they are plus young or plus adult or um, um, plus married or whichever way to understand it. So one boy is koa ako, and uh, for example, for children, it is kokang apiko. Uh, and three men is Milbong uh, um, Aumko. What is again interesting is that we can drop the numeral classifiers from their position um, because the co individuates all of them in terms of counting these uh, items. So instead of having nine sparrows, uh, instead of having P in nine sparrows as um, Papit konangku, it is also possible to simply count, this, count it as uh, papit konangku without the peer. Similarly, for uh, ten eels, as in uh, yubu so ilinko, can be used without so, as in yubu ilinko. Um, so, um, this is also very common in uh, many of the TB languages. Another thing that I'd like to mention is that. Um, there is a way in which uh, these um, numerals occur, as in when it occurs in the free form, um, it is um, kind of uh, not um, agglutinated, but when it is, you know, it, it, it can also be fused together. Um, we will look at those also in a while. So um, the these are some of the samples of mensural classifiers or mensuration that we have uh, collected. Uh, for fist, it is loom, mouthful is gom, and hand. And, 
And um, these are some of the examples, and they occur exactly the individuating ko. So six feet of mud is among lum kang ko, and six feet of kaudang is also uh, gubor lum kang ko. Um, a mouthful of cooked rice is a pin agong ko. Now here, uh, there is no use of um, the numeral one because ko itself indicates one. Uh, similarly, for a handful of rice, as in like ambin aup ko. Um, the other things that we also can notice is that um, the adjectives can be nominalized to intensify the occurrence of uh, this quantification, as in two short persons can have um, the na suffix with the short, as in etet na, and uh, we can interpret it as ani kok etet na tani, which is two short persons, and five long bamboos as uh, so angoko arai na dirbang. So here, so is the classifier occurring with the uh, before the five, and then um, it is intensifying um, and also normalizing at the same time. Um, Dilu has a noun classes which are categorized lexically to indicate their um, items, as in parrot nest. It can be parrot nest or sparrow nest, and as in akang. And um, but um, it also has its own. Uh, numeral classifier to occur with. So here it is co individuating them and classifying them together in terms of counting them. And uh, if you look at the banana plants, um, among occurs as categorizing the plant as in banana or coriander as in ori, and then it still takes the numeral classifier so. So uh, we see that this is more of a noun class or noun classification than a noun classifier. And uh, we see that um, in a normal sentence where it is not specified, um, uh, neither the noun classes occur nor do the numeral classifiers. So I bought prawn has simply sumbur uh, amraka. So the ko also does not occur here because here there's no counting happening. I ate mango similarly is ngo kaidi doka instead of ngo kaidi ko doka. It can be possible, but it, it is also possible not to specify them. And if we look at the word order, um, the classifier can, uh, there are two kinds of word orders here. It, it is flexible, but the more basic word order would be a uh, noun, uh, head noun, followed by the numeral classifier occurring with the numeral. So this is the basic um, word order that we have observed here. So Nisha, would you like to give the introduction? Oh, sorry, conclusion, I mean. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> so we will we would like to conclude that dalu has presence of numeral classifier and absence of noun classifiers rather it has noun categorization of class terms as in categorizing plants holes etc during counting the nouns the numeral classifier is prefixing and can be optionally used dalu has presence of numeral classifier for animate living and concrete objects while absence of numerals classifiers for human. And co for the numeral one is highly productive in individuating all other categorizations of noun. And the numeral uh, can be either first uh, with the classifiers or co occur or, or occur in free form. The marker n nominalizes the adjectives during the noun classification. The basic word order is noun, classifier, numeral, but it can be flexible. That is, uh, it can be both classifier, numeral, noun, and noun, classifier, numeral. So more research is required to understand the use of this classifiers in the loop and other dialects of missing. Next slide, please. So these are the metadata of our informant. And thank you. Um, before uh, we conclude it, I just um, wanted to show the, um, uh, just a minute, um, the fusion of, um, oh yes, for example, here we have uh, Akang, which is six, and then uh, when it is fused, uh, it drops the, vowel um, a, the, the a prefix, so it becomes sokang. 
And it is also possible to have it occurring without the fusion. And it can also occur in free form as in like ongo. So it can be so ongo or it can also be songo. So um, this possibility is there in um, the loop. That's what I wanted to mention. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nisa and Monali. Mm -hmm. You did it very well. And your way of data collection during this uh, COVID-19 time, you use a uh, different, what to say, uh, system of collecting data. It's also very uh, interesting. So now it's open for discussion. Anyone can uh, inquire. I, I have a question about that last slide that you just showed with nest and plant. Are you, are you saying that nest and plant in that case, like I mean for plant is some kind of noun class as opposed to just a compound noun phrase? And if so, could you expand on why? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I can just go back to that slide. Uh, this one? Okay. Yeah, so so why would Kopak I mean not simply be um a, a compound noun phrase is is I mean doing something different here than it would be, for example, in in English, banana plant. Oh, it's a compound actually. Here, what I mean to say is that um, uh, this 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 word, uh, these categories, akang, arung, and among are not uh, classifiers in uh, the loop. They are just a part of the noun class for categorizing all of them, as in like all nest, whether parrot nest or sparrow nest or any nest. That is what I, I mean, but of course these are compounds in a way, yeah. Right, okay. And, yeah. Great, thank uh, you. Berling also has uh, found this uh, categorization in Garo, and it is very much uh, productive even in Dimasa. So that is what I wanted to mention. Is there a different term for a nest that would occur just as a bare noun then, or? Um, I think as a bare noun, it would be a uh, nest as a kung. Simply yes. a kung, yeah. yeah. Okay. And another thing that we can see here is that one snake hole, we have this ako, the fuller uh, one occurring, and you have uh, aum, and instead of it is aum ako, it is aum ko. So that's what I wanted to specify that this one gets individuated for individuating for every other thing, whether there is a noun class or there is no noun class. Thank you. Anybody, please? Any question? Okay. So, meantime, Manali, the optionality of marking in the human noun classifier, no? I think, uh, can you just show the slide of that? Oh, okay, okay. Could I, could I say something? Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, um, in Garo, uh, just um, because since you mentioned Garo, so I just I just wanted to like say that the in Garo it'll be a noun classifier followed by the numeral, and this applies on to almost anything, whether it's plants or human beings or others. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of uh, a lot, lots of classifiers, and according to the shape and size, and according to according to whether they are human beings or whether they are domestic animals or whether they are wild animals, something like this, and uh, so there, therefore, uh, like our form is uh, remains the same. It's noun class uh, classifier followed by the numeral. Say Monday sakto, Monday sakto human beings. Um, classifier suck and doc is numeral six. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Monali, do the yeah. human nouns. Human noun. Oh, human nouns. Mm. Where, I, where have I put the human nouns? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one. So uh, yeah, this is Anma, right? So in all yes, the human yes. nouns, yeah. Even though they are coming, going, uh, means they are in the construction of with one of the numerals, so they are unmarked. And one more, you know, uh, 
observation that intrigued me is that this R is occurring in all the, you know, uh, yeah, I think this is the one that uh, your co projector already pointed out. Uh, one, yes, two, the R prefix. Yeah, yeah. R, R, R is a prefix. So can you, yeah. you know, establish yeah. some you know, argument here why uh, this is mark, you know, because in most of the examples in your numeral classifier, wherever numeral is coming, the classifier it also comes, but especially in human nouns, it is unmarked. Yeah. Um, this is something not just there in uh, machine, it is also there in Dimasa. But in Dimasa, we have option of human, you know, uh, quantification. For example, we have the human classifier Shao, which is person. So I can have uh, one person as Shao Shi Shbung or Shbung Shao Shi. Uh, but uh, if I say two persons, instead of saying like, you know, uh, you, instead of using the shao, I can use directly the uh, gov prefixes there, the ga normalizing prefixes, gini, katham, and that is also there in garo. So I can say shpung gini, and the ga prefix is actually quantifying them. So we don't have to use uh, the classifiers uh, for humans because already when we count it, the, there's certain, you know, uh, numeral prefixes or numeral suffixes that are there, which help in counting um, items. And the, when we when we use the ga prefix in Dimasa, it is basically used for counting humans only. Similarly, mm -hmm. I think uh, when the a prefix is used in uh, machine, it is basically used to count uh, humans. And the ko is mandatory because ko is used to individuate all other um, items into the counting. So um it looks to me that the R prefix is actually indicating the counting of the humans. Mm -hmm. That is what I think is happening okay. here. Yeah, that's very good clarification. And the optionality of here again that you have shown in one of the table that it's optional, yeah. it's also optional, and it yes. can be with or without that is one. So what yes. are the circumstances or what triggers that it can be, you know? Of, and sometimes it is also obligatory it means uh, what are those environment or the context where it should be there means obligatorily or it can be dropped also i think it's more about uh, specificity and uh, you know making it generic so when we use these sorted classifiers we're specifying them into a particular semantic um, you know a category but and if we just want to count them you know just want to generalize them in terms of counting then we simply can drop it and keep using the code i mm -hmm. think that is the only reason why it is optional yeah because it gives the same meaning only with or without it yes yes mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah anybody this is not the question it's uh, my curiosity. The, the language name is Dilu. It's a dialect, uh, Dilu. Yeah, it's a Dilu. machine dialect. Uh, dialect of missing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned only in Assam area, right? Yeah, this is from the Assam area in, in and around Sipsagar district. Okay. Uh, I noticed that uh, it is uh, more or less similar to Adi language also. Okay. So that uh, is it uh, available in the Arunachal area also, adjoining area of uh, Assam. Yeah, that would be interesting to know because our informants are not aware of you know uh, Dilu speakers in Arunachal Pradesh. They told us that uh, they are found in and around uh, the district where they are located. I think that would give us some scope to explore in the future if there is any difference between the Dilu dialect spoken in Arunachal and there could be so much of intra-convergence and divergence also. Yeah, thank you for that um, possibility. We will look at that. And another, um, this one, classifiers are always uh, after the noun, right? In case yeah. of Hindi or English, uh, we can already see that uh, before the noun. Hmm. Uh, is it possible to keep it uh, before the noun? Yes, yes. I have uh, mentioned the word order here and it is flexible. 
I think uh, mostly it is possible because um, I think Krishna wants to get in. Okay. Um, here it is possible to have both ways. I mean, of course I can switch, I can swipe the word order for both of the sentences also. Um, the only reason when we swipe it is to, you know, focus or topicalize that particular thing. Are we going to focus on the entity noun or are we going to focus on the counting? So if we, if, if we want to focus on the counting, then it comes before. And if we want to, you know, focus on the entity, then it comes, um, the entity comes before. So I think that is why we have flexible word order in uh, mission. Okay, thank it you. It is possible, yeah. Yeah, uh, one, what is the question in the chat box uh, from Kellen? Or oh. or this, yeah. It you you don't have there. to answer that now. We don't we don't need to take more time. I think we're probably running out. So just some other time, if you could let me know, I'd be curious. Okay, okay. That's okay. an interesting okay. question though for snakes because I don't think they have seen any big snakes except for maybe Python, but then it's interesting that they have kind of, uh, there's so much of semanticity, semanticity happening. Also, it might be that a snake which has just, you know, had food, it might go big and there could be some classifiers sure, for yeah. those kind of snakes. So um, that would be very interesting to look at. Ma Mandarin has a similar case if you want a comparison point. Okay, okay. Anyway, any last question? I think there is no question. Anyway, thank you, Nisa and Monali, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you. Let, so us, much. Uh, uh, let us go to uh, second speaker. Yes. Yes, Inder Kumar Singh. Structural and functional analysis of uh, verbal reduplication in Manipuri. Please, uh, Inder Kumar. Yes, let me cheer. Uh, I think my screen is visible. Yeah, it's it's okay. Full screen. It's... Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, respected here, my dear friends. My name is Sagol Sumindra Kumar Singh from the Department of Linguistics and Private Languages, Tripura University. Uh, the title of my presentation today is Structural and Functional Analysis of Verbal Reduplication in Manipuri. Your, your volume is a little bit low. Okay, I'll increase. Yeah. Okay. So these are the areas I'll be covering in this presentation. Manipuri is a, a Tibetan to Burman language spoken in Manipur. Uh, Northeastern state of India. In this language, reduplication plays a significant role in communication. It becomes a morphological device which is widely used in human languages. What classes, uh, such as nouns, pronouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives undergo reduplication in Manipuri? Uh, but the traditional studies on Manipuri reduplication are confined only to the categories such as nouns, pronouns, uh, adverbs and adjectives, but the Trojan study investigates verbal reduplication structurally and functionally. Well, structural reduplication, uh, structural analysis, I mean, structural analysis will cover uh, morphological and uh, lexical reduplication, and functional analysis will cover semantic reduplication and reduplication in capping manner and plurality. Before I begin with core area of the analysis, it would be worth to mention something here about the structure of Manipuri verb. Manipuri verbs are bound in nature, verbal roots are monomorphic, bimorphic, and compound in nature. So here we can see an examples, laoi, lao, south, e, right, Sena, involved, signa, uh, suspect, look, uh, 
Nungsi, bear, noluk, viambul, cannot stand on their own unless and until affixes such as aspect, nominalizer, adverb, mood, access to our bed. So uh, below examples, Lawi is shouted, Ire has been written, Tenare has been involved, Tsingne is suspected, Nungsi na barely, Nolukpa to be humble become full fledged now. Uh, in the uh, in, in the following verbal reduplication, the pair elements together act as a word. That is, the entire repeated form represents a word. Uh, for instance, tangak tangak, marong marong, chara chara represent a word. But the single occurrence or isolation of these uh, the elements in the pair never carry carries any meaning. Like uh, we cannot say tangak marong chara is uh, they cannot uh, exist alone. Which can also be seen in the sentences like uh, makoi yamna taha tahai. They are very hasty. The single occurrence of this uh, verbal root taha in sentence two is ungrammatical and uh, unacceptable. So we can't say makoi yamna tahai. Only the expression makoi yamna tahai is uh, unnatural, uh, but we have to say, and we have to uh, construct the sentence like Makoyama Taha Tahai. So here in this examples, the entire uh, reduplicated structures, Tano Tano, okay, Taseng Taseng, Tangak Tangak in sentences three, five, and seven respectively are the sensible regular verbs which are treated as words. These reduplicated forms represent a word since morpheme segmentation is not possible within the combining constituents. So uh, sentences in four, six, and eight uh, are unacceptable and ungrammatical. Uh, instead, we can say machu si yamna tano tanawi. This color is very new. So we can say only machusiyama tanong we. And wafam do tasing tasing le, the word is real. So instead, uh, instead of this, we cannot say wafam do tasing le, this is unnatural again. Then we cannot say also the sentence in six, six, masamsi tangangi. Instead of tangang, uh, we, uh, we have to say that masamsi tangang tangangi. So, So, uh, lexical reduplication can be analyzed into two ways. One is reduplication with grammaticalized morphism and uh, echo formation. In reduplication due to grammaticalized morphism, verbal prefixes such as kang, koi, pang, um, play a significant role that whenever any occurrence of these prefixes, the respective verbal root is compulsorily reduplicated. So uh, we will see this grammaticalized morphism one by one. Uh, the prefix kang is derived from a lexical item called kangba to be started. The root kang is a bound form and become a full slice form only when it gets a ditch with inflection and, and uh, derivative suffixes. Uh, for instance, we can say kangi is startled. This very sentence can be negated as kangde is not startled. When this root kung is used as a prefix that is added to a verbal root, it performs a grammatical function and the meaning it carries is suddenness or instantaneousness. So examples in sentence nine and 11 reveals that uh, the compulsory reduplication of the verbal root that is kung in, in, in is the verbal root here. This uh, verbal root is reiterated Kung in in and kung sao sao. Uh, that means that after the prefixation of the uh, kung, the verbal roots in and the sao are compulsorily uh, reduplicated. And also, we can not hear that the verbal roots, uh, these verbal roots are monosyllabic. Sentences 10 and 12 are ungrammatical and unacceptable due to the lack of fulfillment to the part of the verb. It requires verbal repetition. 
Uh, in these examples, uh, the prefix kang also occurs with disyllabic verbal groups. Uh, for instance, nung si in uh, sentence 13 and nung ai in sentence 15, but still uh, the verbal reduplication is compulsory, although there are the, uh, disyllabic verbal groups and single occurrence of eight, as we can see in sentence 14 and uh, 16 are ungrammatical. Uh, but one fact is that the total or complete reduplication of the disyllabic verbal root is impossible as in uh, 14. As in 14, and, uh, and uh, next, as in uh, 16, we cannot say and in 16. Instead, partial reduplication of the verbal root takes place as in sentence 13 and 15, where the first syllable of disyllabic verbal root is copied. I suddenly started feeling like loving her. Uh, here, the verbal root is not repeated, only the uh, initial syllable is repeated. Similarly, it happens in sentence 15 also, Paudu Tavada I certainly feel happy to have heard the news. The prefix koi is related to the existence of a lexical item called koiba, to move round or to go round. When it is prefixed to verbal root, the meaning it carries is to move about endlessly to move, to move without any destination or to move around everywhere. We can see these examples. So uh, the prefix koi is added to the verbal root chat in 17, and uh, it is uh, reiterated as koi chat chat li. In the next in sentence uh, 19, but koi chi tiri. And koi lao lauri in sentence 21 expressing complete meaning. The prefix punk is derived from a lexical item pang ba to be foolish. This verbal root punk occurs as a prefix to another verbal root. Whenever it is prefixed to another verbal root, the verbal root is reiterated compulsively and it carries the meaning of doing something simply, doing something carelessly, doing something foolishly, or doing something recklessly, or without good reason, as in uh, these examples for uh, the ngangi in sentence 23, uh, laoi in 25, uh, these sentences are uh, grammatical, but uh, a range of non-reduplicated verbal forms in 24 and 26 are ungrammatical. Instead, we can say Mahakti Pangang Nangi is fixed without reason. Angau Vadu, Angau, uh, Angau Vadu, Panglao Lawi. The madman starts unreasonably. So, uh, non reduplicated verbal form in uh, 24, Mahakti Pangangi. We cannot say an Angau Vadu Panglao Lawi. This is Unacceptable. Uh, there is a nominant lexical item called mapum pol. So uh, the first syllable ma uh, is an inalienable prefix, and uh, the second syllable pum is a nominant bound root. This nominant bound root pum is used as a prefix to a verbal root, thereby reduplicating the verbal verbal. Uh, root and the meaning it carries is completeness, totality, fully, or wholeness. So some monosyllabic verbal roots uh, which take the prefix poem are given here. Pum lang langba to be noisy fully, then pum chai saiba to be untidy completely, pum hang hangba to be empty completely, then um toi toi ba, to break completely, um tat tat ba, uh, to be torn uh, completely. 
Uh, syntactically, we can see the occurrence of whom with uh, verbal beautification, the verbal uh, root joy, which is completely copied uh, with the prefix boom in sentence 27, uh, like uh, what could say, um, joy, joy. I got completely nervous. And in sentence 29, mama do um, ngawre, the mother has completely gone mad. So these sentences uh, fulfill all the requisite. So uh, due to the <clears throat> prefix boom, the verb roots joy and now are required to be reiterated uh, because we cannot say uh, we cannot say what will say pum joy re and mama do pum ngao re we cannot say like this. Next one is echo formation in verbal echo formation the echo word that follows the verbal base is always meaningless the echo word obtains an idea of generality. Only when it adds a bit to the meaningful base word, this is a uh, concept. I, uh, the peer construction so uh, slight variation either in the initial or the final syllable. Verbal conformation is very uh, rare, and uh, it is formed by replacing the initial syllables of the first word, uh, such as my in the first instance, and uh, luck in the second instance, and third in the Ka uh, in the third instance, as can be uh, seen here, sakang mai kang naba, sakang mai kang naba. This sak, the first syllable of this sak is replaced by uh, mai, then it comes as sakang mai kang naba. Similarly, it happens in the next instance also. Tank is replaced by lak, tengai, lakaiba, then mipai. Tabaiba, here me is replaced by ta and form me by tabaiba to be desperate. In semantic reduplication, uh, the elements in the period construction are verbal roots, which can be, uh, which can take place, uh, 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 which, which can take uh, aspects, nominalizer, etc., and semantically related. Uh, for instance, in the verbal uh, root kak means uh, to have a loud noise, and the verbal root lao means to scream abruptly. The entire uh, paired word kak lauba expresses the meaning of thunderbolt, which comes with a flash of light. Similarly, uh, as an instance, the kung heiba, kung heiba, the, 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 the root kung, the root kung means to know. And uh, the root hai means to learn. The entire pair word carries the meaning of scholar or intellectual. That is one who knows or, uh, and learn is the scholar or intellectual. Reduplication indicating manner consists of the verbal root which modified the main verb. For instance, tuna tuna in uh, sentence 31, tapna tapna, slowly in sentence 32 describes their respective main verb, ngangi and uh, chatli. Ozadu, tuna, tuna, ngangi. The teacher speaks quickly, then ahaldu, tapna tapna, chatli, the old man walks slowly, and mamadu, uh, ngang ngang na, chokre. So, uh, Means that same process, same process is also uh, followed in sentence 30, 33. Mama do ngang ngang na chokre. That is the verbal root ngang 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 describes uh, the main verb chokre. These are some verbal to uh, verbal reduplication derived from state state verb action uh, or process verbs. Whenever they occur, they always modify the main verb with can be seen as follows. So, pana pana tumpre, pana pana. Okay, pana pana tumpre. You can say pana pana tumpre. He has gone asleep while reading and sauna sauna tsekre. He left uh, angrily. Reduplication in getting plurality consists of uh, verbal roots specifying the attributes of nouns uh, which followed on. 
Uh, the occurrence of uh, this uh, verbal root will let the following nouns to be plural, or if not plural, to the following nouns, the quantifying words like kaya, mayam. Uh, kaya, many, mayam, a lot, uh, yamna, very, pudding, all, uh, pundamak, everything, etc., are added after the noun which is supposed to be plural. Following examples can be uh, discussed in sentence 34. The verbal root chaura chauraba, this chaura chauraba, uh, uh, this chaura chauraba met the following noun to rel, to be plural with the plural suffix sink. The, uh, the noun quote in uh, 35, again, quote, the noun quote, pink, 35 and 35 uh, is uh, N. So uh, the such reduplication indicate uh, plurality. So angang duna saharu saru ba pot kuding machi oide. So instead of adding plural sing, uh, we can also use a lexical item which indicates the plurality that is kuding can be added. So instead of saying angang duna saharu saru ba pot ching. So uh, instead of that, uh, sing, just removing the sink, we can add kuding. Whatever uh, the child had was unhealthy. Uh, the present work is an advancement clarifying the manifestation of uh, compulsory verbal root reduplication in the investigation of the verbal reduplication. So differently from the earlier works uh, of reduplication, the present work as a whole establishes the nature of verbal uh, reduplication. Uh, I have discussed the levels of verbal reduplication. Uh, and uh, these are some references. Thank you. Thank you, Indra Kumar. We all want to say the uh, paper is open for a uh, discussion. Any question from our participants? Okay, so can I come in quickly, Tamo? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Tamo and Rakumar, for this wonderful presentation. So uh, this is not a very you know direct question on your presentation, but rather it can be a discussion as well. So uh, can you bring to the manner slide? Dana Chana, uh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Here. Uh, this one, Tamo. Uh, this uh, tuna, 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 tuna. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, uh, whether. I think I next, would, next slide. Uh, yeah, this one. This, this is the one. So I don't okay. know whether I'm, maybe it may be my confusion also. Uh, I don't think this are the bhab roots. That's my one observation. Uh, 31 and the 32. Uh, you mean that this was the root two? Okay. Two. Yeah. Ah, okay. So uh, due to the addition of this uh, adverbial na, actually the origin of this two is the verbal root. But here in this sentence with the addition of na adverbial, it functions in adverb modifying the following verb ngangi. So to na to ngangi. In fact, the origin of this two is the verb. You can say, uh, I am not too rare. That this very true can take the inflections also. I am not too rare. So uh, this is a verb root, I feel like that. All right. Uh, okay. The same thing for tough also in that case. Yes, yes, in that case. Also. Okay. Isn't it okay? Uh, yeah. uh, adjective, adjective, or the verb is you do? Uh, adverb. Uh, Mm -hmm. ah, yes. Uh, 
Ah, uh, okay. If we uh, analyze uh, in isolation like tuba, this uh, that modifies a noun. Okay, a tui. I can say a tu tui. Okay. So, uh, but here tu is the verb. Tu is the verb root that can inflect. That can take inflections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tui. Simple aspect marker we can take, and the perfect aspect marker we uh, these two can take. Similarly, it happens in tough also. Yeah. Vision, it's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. Yeah, Amo has given the answer. Yeah. So I think for that, uh, please come to the, uh, that slide, uh, Indrakumar. Which slide? The, the, the previous slide uh, we discussed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, this one. one. No, yeah. This, this one. I think, no, no. Uh, manner, manner one. one. Yes. This one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Here, uh, can you give uh, us uh, one example is, uh, with the uh, two root in the sentence as a uh, word. I am not tree. We can say I am not tree. Oh, Mahagam not ture. I correct to Vani. I correct to Vani. I'll be a little bit hasty. I'll be a little bit quick. And I am not ture. I'm a little bit hurry. And uh, I am Makoi correct to Gre. They were a little bit uh, hurry. In a specific way, it might be, but uh, in general, um, Tuba itself, uh, it's like uh, um, adjective and may become due to the suffix uh, adverb, right? So, uh, please look up once more. Yes, in that case, uh, we can analyze in that way also. But here in this uh, analysis, this uh, two, yeah. uh, the origin of the two, this very uh, verb, this very root is the verb yeah. because of that it can modify uh, another verb again so when we talk about the adverb so here even if, function adverb even if we add uh, this uh, suffix uh, na in case of ngang na ngang na mm -hmm. then uh, it may become that means we cannot uh, what to say uh, uh, change into other root that means the the root ngang means already not that red one uh, speaking. Speak. So yeah, speak, speak is the verbal root. Yeah. Speak nang, is the verbal root. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why mm, yes. in general uh, sense, yes. tuba or tapa, right? Mm -hmm. And supposing angang ba, not a uh, speaker, right? So, so maybe, uh, maybe these three uh, roots, uh, then 31, 32, 33, you know, it's trigger means that they are very tricky. It yeah. depends on yeah. how it has been analyzed and it has been constructed as well. Yeah. Like na 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 uh, in this construction, it's uh, we seems like it's adverbial. But when we say mahag yam ngangi again, then it's being used as a verb again. Means it can take more inflections. Yes. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you, Tamu, yeah, for yeah. bringing up you know uh, yeah. this kind of beautiful you know presentation. Thank you, thank you. And there, uh, Tamu, can you uh, scroll down once? Uh, there are some more interesting data. This is one, no? Yeah, this may be the one also, yeah. All these things like, you know, these roots, uh, 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 this, uh, yeah, yeah. These are also the same case. Pana, 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 you know, uh, larik pana, pana, chai, we can also say. Maglarikpai means in both the construction it can be have in different categories. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, that's what my observations. Yeah. Any last question, please? Sir Marcel, any question? Uh, uh, no more, sir. Thank you. Okay.
Okay then, uh, let us uh, switch to uh, next presenter. Thank you, Indra Kumar, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you. I will stop my sharing. Next uh, presenters are um, Pritam Kumar and Haisnam Kiani. Their topic is uh, the semantic analysis of suffix sin and suffix to in Manipuri. Please, uh, Pritam Kumar and Kiani. Hello, dear. Hello. Yes, yes. Yes. Sir, is my screen uh, visible? No, no. Screen is paused. Why is this paused? It is in the process. Uh, resume share. It is screen sharing. Just wait for some time. We can see that. Pritam has started screen sharing. So let's wait. Or if you have given the PPT to Pigeon, then Pigeon can display it. I think I have not received the PPT. So what you can do is you can okay. stop and reshare. If it's not working. I have already. Okay. Just showing that Pritam has started. Yeah, coming. Okay. Yes, please okay. start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to present paper on the semantic analysis of the suffixes sin and talk in Manipuri. And today we are going to discuss the various topics uh, in these papers, including occurrence, allomorph, directional marker, intention, and indicating degree. To begin with, <coughs> Manipuri is a Tibetan Burman language of Manipur, uh, <coughs> which has various names such as Miteilon, Miteiron, Miteiron, Miteilon, Mitei, or Mitei, because of la and pre uh, variation between la and uh, na. And since it is a proto of and verb final language, a single verb could be a sentence. Moreover, the agglutinating property of the language demands many suffixes to concatenate with the root to form a new word. For example, in the sentence like cha ki ga ni ko, where cha is the root word and ki, ga, ni, and ko, these are the various suffixes which are added to the root cha. So in this way, uh, various word of, of words are formed with the addition of these suffixes. And the main objective of the paper is to show that uh, this every suffixes has its meaning in a particular environment and the role they play according to the context in uh, it occurs. So let's have a look in the another construction like nang chak cha In this sentence, we have two ra marker that is ra one and ra two, but the ra one and ra two possess different functions. The ra one, which is added near near to the root cha, it uh, carries the functions of the perfective, and the ra two, which are added after the nominalizer ba, it carries the functions of the question marker. So it, we cannot claim that ra uh, all the times carries the functions of uh, interrogative markers. So um, these two suffixes sin and talks they generally occur after the verbal roots uh, followed by the perfective marker la, intentional marker k, k, suggestive marker c, command marker lu or lo, nominalizer pa or ba, definitive marker ki, prohibitive marker kanu, ganu, etc. And their occurrences are illustrated in the examples uh, in the construction like mahakna chaktu, Chasin Labra. And in the next sentence, A1, Mahakna Chaktu Chathok Labra. Both the uh, interpretation of these two sentences are same, but in the first sentence, it is Chasin Labra. The root word cha it itself carries the inward movement of the actions. Uh, 
And in the second sentence, Satok Labra, it also uh, carries the uh, both in the both the sentence carries the intention of doing or performing the action, but in the, the A1 sentence, Satok Labra, some there is a lack of some formality. So we usually use the word Charsin Labra, but the Chatok Labra is also an acceptable uh, word formation. Again, in the next construction, like Aina Chaktu Chasin Ge, and in the next sentence, B1, Aina Chaktu Chatok Ge. Since I have already discussed in my earlier slide that Ge and Ge, they also present the intended marker. And in this sentence, uh, the verb root Chasin Ge and Chatok Ge, in this construction, but there is uh, indications of the presence of double indication of uh, intentive markers. And in the next construction, like Jadu Thaksin C, let's have the drink the tea, and in C1, Jadu Thaktok C, both are also permissible construction in Manipur language. Tandu Chasin Lo and Tandu Chatok Lo. The only difference is the lack of formality and informality. In the case of Chasin C, some uh, proper some uh, proper use of pragmatic is there, but in the case of Chato, oh, uh, the use of talk is, uh, it doesn't mean that it is not uh, possible, but it's possible, but uh, it, uh, it is not, we don't use it uh, in formal ways. That's the only difference. And these uh, sin and talk, they have uh, various allomorph and they are used according to the various uh, environments they occurs. Uh, like sin has three allomorphs like sin, Jin and Jin. And talk has also three allomorphs like talk, talk, and talk. And their environments is uh, if the sin and talks are used when their verb root is ended with by vowels, diphthongs, or nasal sound. For example, the words like jasin ba or chatok ba, lovsin ba or lotok ba, jamsin ba or jamtok ba. Again, the next allomorph. Jin and talks are used after the verb roots uh, ended with voiceless sounds. For example, in the construction like takjin ba or taktok ba, techin ba or tetok ba, sechin ba or setok ba. And another, the other along of jin and talks, they occur after the roots begins with aspirated and fricative sounds. For example, uh, the words like fajin ba or fadokpa, fujinba, or fudokpa, sujinba, or sudokpa, kanjinba, and kandokpa. <clears throat> so in order to make it more concrete, uh, it is elaborated in the table where sin, jin, and chin, and their various environments along with the examples are shown. Sin is uh, used after the vowel sound and voice velar sound, for example, lang sin ba. And jin are used after the morpheme that begins with an, an aspirated sound and ends with vowels or nasal sound, for example, hygiene ba. And jin is used after morpheme that begins with an aspirated sound and ends in a soap sound, for example, words like kuchin ba. And for the case of the suffix talks, uh, talk are they are used after voice and vowel sounds, for example, pang tok ba. And for the case of alomorph dog, they are used after the roots that begins with aspirated and fricative sounds, for example, words like padokpa. And for the case of allomorph talks, they are used after the roots ending with voiceless sounds such as setokpa. <clears throat> so uh, to begin with the cases where the mainly sin and talks are used, the first case is the use of directional marker day. And these two suffixes, of, uh, they are used as directional marker in the sense that they indicate the direction of an action or direction of something to be happened. For example, uh, sin mainly indicates the inward movement of the action or direction and talk indicates the outward direction. So in the construction like fidu, pusinlo, uh, take the cloth inside and in 2B construction like fidu, puto, u, take, the, take out the cloth. So in this construction, sin carries the functions of internal, uh, directional marker, which is inward in uh, position. And in the construction like fidu puto u, it carries the uh, outward movement of the action. And in the next construction like ma bu kausin lu, that is call him inside, 
and uh, 3B, Mabu Kautou, that is, call him out. So <clears throat> in this case, it is noted that the suffix sin and talk cannot function as the directional marker in every context it occur. Uh, they can function as directional marker only when they occur with some verbal roots, so which can take both sin and talk as counterpart to each other. So what are the verbal roots which can take both sin and talk? So who, uh, which been to bring, who to throw, go to call, chen, uh, to run, lung, to throw, yay, to hit, hun, to throw. And furthermore, if these two suffixes occur with verbal roots, which are associated with direction, these two suffixes do not function as directional markers. For example, let's have a look in the verbal roots like lao. Say, for example, uh, we uh, saw towards at him. And but uh, this 4a is grammatical. Uh, and but the 4B construction, it is not accept, uh, acceptable uh, construction in Manipuri. But the same, but the verb root lao itself carries the outward movement of the action. But in the construction of 4B, uh, uh, with the additions of the suffix lao talk, it cannot uh, carries the functions of the outward movement of the action. Again, let's have look another, uh, have look in another. Sorry, send the construction like mahakna. Pidu uh, he takes the clothes, uh, and mahakna fidu lautoi. In this case, both four C and four D are are also acceptable. <clears throat> Likewise, examples four C and four D have some interpretation, and the suffixes sin and talk do not indicate the different directions of action. However, there could be different contexts regarding the, uh, the example 4C and 4D. If talks occurs with lao, as in example 4E below, it means to declare or announce something publicly where talk does not give the meaning of direction of action or something else. For example, in the sentence like maha na wa du lao to e. Okay, when in this sense of if whenever it is lao, talk is added to the lao, he announces the news. It becomes an grammatically accepted sentence. But in the earlier construction, it, it, it is not acceptable one. And uh, next case is the uh, case for uh, sewing intention. And here in this case, like chak tu chasin lu. And chak tu chato u. But these constructions carries in word and outward movement, but also it carries another function, which is the intention of the speaker or the person who is going to eat. And furthermore, if the verbal roots, which can take both, verb, uh, both the suffixes, which are associated with the directionality, both the suffixes function as intentional markers. For example, in the construction like, and so these are the, some verbal roots. Uh, there are some verbal roots which can take both sin and talk as in the examples uh, like Mahakna Fidu Nupidagi Lao Sin Ba Pami. That is, he wants to take the clothes from the womb from the woman's uh, inside uh, some uh, any store in, and keep it in some uh, uh, in, in, uh, inside the room. And in the construction of five uh, uh, five F, Mahakna Fidu Nupidegi Lautokpa Pami. He wants to take out the code from the woman. <clears throat> Again, in these examples, both sin and talk have the same interpretation and indicate the same direction that is toward him in this context. However, in the examples below, Fidu Lausin Lu and Fidu Lautou. This uh, of the what the suffixes sin and talk they do not perform as directional marker. Rather, they indicate the intention of the speaker with also some command uh, marker. And the next uh, case is for the case of indicating degree. In this uh, construction, like do tensely, that is the stick becomes short. And mahak masak e it means she becomes beautiful. Uh, in this case, both sin and talks indicate the degree of beauty and the shortness of the stick. Uh, so in this uh, context with some static verbs, sin and talk perform the functions of indicating uh, degree. 
So in the conclusion sections, uh, we would like to say that in Manipuri, suffixes play a very important role in word formation process. And one suffix can function more than one according to the different environment they occur. And among those in and to also perform many functions in different contexts. And we have discussed uh, three functions of sin and talks along with their various allomorph, and they are directional, intentional, and degree. And we need to for establish more paradigms for this uh, case in order to make a clear cut about uh, this. So uh, these are the abbreviations which I which we use while making the paper and the uh, references. So uh, thank you. So any suggestion from the experts are all most welcome. Thank you, uh, Pritam and Kenny. The session is open for uh, discussion and question. Any question, please? Um, yeah, I just want to ask one question to Kenny. Um, first of all, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I know is uh, seen and talk, are they also uh, lexicature? Are they grammaticalized from some kind of, you know, lexeme? Can they occur in free form, seen and top? No. They are, are okay. suffixes always attached to the verb. Okay, why I ask this is because um, <clears throat> we have this uh, seen as a lexeme in uh, Dimasa, it's uh, bishing, um, which yeah. means inside. And, and we, yeah. we use it as a post position and it can um, it can occur with any noun like you know inside the house and i can say no only vision and yeah. we 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 can also uh, suffix it uh, when we want to indicate the location of it as in inside so we instead of using the vision the bow there we just drop it and just use shing so i just thought that if shin is also you know uh, it has its etymological part from being uh, like uh, a lexeme um, what about uh, malefective verbs? Um, say, say the verb steal, and if I say the thief stole uh, money. So in that case, uh, do you still use, uh, can, is it possible to use sin there or will you be using talk or put? Is it possible to use uh, these uh, suffixes? Yeah, we can make some construction like run, bana potu, hura, like that. So there can seen occur in the stealing? No. No. No, no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, we can say huran sin or huran to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. What about sneak? If I say like, um, the boy sneak in, uh, sneak in, or can I can, can I use sin there? Hello, ma'am. Can you please repeat the question? No, no, I don't think so. That's not possible, Munani. It's one with the sin and talk sneak is not possible. What about, and... what, what about sneaking sneaking in? What about chin chin ba? Chin yeah, suppose chin. suppose there is a suppose there is a rush and there is a boy who is you know trying to sneak from there and come out. So, can you use seen there? Yes, yes. Yes, we can use that. In that yeah, there, there was yeah. one elomorph. Yeah, I think so. There was one elomorph. Uh, yes. Okay. Something like chen chen, chen chen ba chen tok pa. Okay. Yeah, chen chen ba chen tok pa is possible. Yeah, are possible. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to view the, the, the introduction slide. Okay, sir. <clears throat> Is this? Uh, yes. the next one. Okay. Ah, yes. Uh, here, Cha Kigani Ko. Have you seen? I will, I will eat definitely. You have translated as definitely. Uh, I feel that this is not a question, but I feel that this cha uh, kigani ko have this. That is something like the meaning is something like 
से समथिंग लाइक दैट Aza, Marcel's uh, idea is uh, without adding this last suffix ko, then yes, the, yes. the meaning is uh, all right. Yeah, yes. it's due, also due, still yeah. Due to this adding uh, ko suffix, then the intention is somewhat different, right? Yeah. Sakhi gani. Yeah, sakhi gani and sakhi gani ko ko is the uh, kinds of uh, in German the shopping of the uh, space. Yeah. Um, what uh, what to say uh, meaning is uh, deflected anyway thank you yeah. okay thank you any questions this uh, this co is not compulsory here right no. yeah, yeah. yeah 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 not compulsory oh. but with the addition of this co uh, it indicates that uh, we surely uh, perform no, no. the action uh, that he, he, he or she is reminding someone oh. that uh, i will do the action that's, that's the, without this okay. also uh jaki gani it's also possible as a promise okay. as uh, a promise you, but it you carries the strong yeah. emphasis of the sentence that's why uh suppose suppose nani ko tekniko and see that yeah, yeah. see that uh, make sure or see that uh, Elmin sickness does not happen, or eating does not happen. Kap kani ko see that the child is not that do not cry. In real sense, uncle, uh, this kind of word is very ambiguous in meaning. If we don't have a context, then as yes, yes, as we were discussing about cha ki kani ko, the translated meaning I will it definitely is possible, and the one that you have suggested that make sure that it should not be eaten. That's also possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. we need a context where mm. such mm. words or such verbs should be, you know, uh, constructed. I think there is one uh, question and uh, query in the chat box. If you both of you can see it, or the chair can read it out also. I think it's also the same kind of question that I have asked. Yeah, and it's there in uh, Boro as well as a lexeme. So they just want to know if it if it can occur alone. Yeah. Yeah, unless they are attached to a verb root, I think uh, it cannot give a fullest meaning by only like sin or talk. It's not possible. That's very interesting because. See, uh, uh, Sorry for interruption. The question, the question put by uh, Dr. Monali is very reasonable uh, because there is possible, uh, there is there is possibility for uh, this one uh, talk. Sin, I don't, I don't feel. Uh, but for the talk, talk, uh, we we have a lexical item called talk. This lexical item can be used as a verb uh, in a sentence. So mahak talk re means that he went out. So this very talk used as a suffix here. So I, I think this is a grammaticalized morpheme or not is uh, yet to be investigated. So, yes, yes, yeah, 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 I yeah. agree that sir. Uh, Manipuri verb roots are also homo, some uh, homo Manipuri verb roots are also homophonous and also the suffixes are also homophonous. Manipuri it has the homophonous properties of both roots and as well as suffixes. But for the case of suffixes, and again, uh, there are also lots of allomorph also, and they are used according to the different environments, uh, according to the ending of the verb roots, and uh, some restriction are also there. Yeah. Any question? Uh, Some uh, man from uh, Padma Bhati Achom, he uh, she says Manu will mean it's inside in uh, Maithil Lawn. Yes, yes. ma'am. Uh, it will mean uh, inside. 
is the continuation of the Sagar Boro you know, query. Okay. Then, then uh, what is outside? Yeah. What is outside? Ma'am, uh, Mapan is uh, itself uh, outside, but uh, for the, whether the action is been uh, doing inside and outside, we also put this uh, fixes marker. But uh, we can also say like he uh, Mapan the Tokre. Mapan is itself the outside, the outside place, outside the room or outside any uh, this uh, and uh, you again add another this suffix. Uh, talk in order in order to indicate that he has also left uh, outside the room that like that sensor mm -hmm. <coughs> okay uh, uh, is seen seen in my alone always as a fix or can it also stand alone no. uh, I don't think sir uh, it, it is as a fix right but uh, uh, it itself cannot occur alone it is uh, if it is occurring alone, it carries different meaning. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right, no? Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, Davo, I have an argument uh, that uh, was put by other participants as well uh, regarding the, you know, uh, this sin and talk to be considered as, you know, a full-fledged lexical item that can stand alone. For example, that you have given Mahap Mapan Thok Re. So, uh, because of the you know inflection ray only it's possible if we are supposed to say mahamapan talk that is not possible like you know as a yeah. place you know word or lexical item that that is the uh, argument that i would like to put that thin or the talk that many of the you know participants are you know they have a curiosity to know that whether they are the gr grammaticalized form of some lexical item or they are purely you know as affixes so uh, actually, this is a very good research done by two of the presenters, but from my point of view as a speaker, uh, I don't think so. It can stand alone unless, you know, it is attached to a root, like, you know, Mahap Thokre, Mahap Mapan Thokre, both can give the same meaning, but in that case also Mahap Thok, it's not possible. Hmm. That is okay, one thing. Uh, when, yeah. Yeah, and, and when the uh, question arises, like where did he, uh, where does he go? Like only in that case, we we reply that Mahatma Pan Thokre. But that place it, itself, in the talk itself, uh, he has gone outside. It is uh -huh. it, the talk itself carries the directional marker of outside. So we don't need to put again this place of uh, where that is Mapan. We don't need to put this Mapan again. It is itself See, understood in the suffix itself. Uh, uh, when you when you place when you uh, study this one uh, sin and the talk you uh, you have also discussed the direction sin and talk okay so when out or he has gone out uh, that is fine but uh, say when we talk about a sentence like uh, uh, we said some some sound or some uh, announcement was made from your side, from one body or from an organization, that the same meaning happens there also. Talk, that talk carries the same meaning with that mark of talk. So if the talk carries the same meaning with that uh, full lexical item, then why not that suffix derive from, uh, derive from that uh, particular verbal root and uh, it acts like a, like a grammaticalized morpheme. So this is uh, uh, this is what I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Thank yeah. you. Can, can yeah. you come to this uh, uh, more slides table? Okay. Can you come to? Yes, 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 sir. Yeah. Not this one. Uh, table. Yeah. Here in the first line, you uh, wrote like this after all vowel sound and voice bailer sound. Nah. So here, uh, better look up uh, more deeply. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Because I think we can uh, have um, still. You, yours is a vowel and voice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, vowel and vowel, uh, voice, bell and nasal sound. Not only this nasal sound, but also... Yeah, uh, let, my, let me... Yeah. Uh, 
let me give you uh, one uh, you can you can what you say look up more examples yeah that means sachin ba ta is not voice right mm. nanchin ba yeah na is there okay yeah, yeah. so update this portion yeah and again uh, here in the first line of a uh, second table that means the uh, hook right yeah of hook ba sachin ba right mm. so uh, uh, analyze more examples so that you can yes. what is that means if you yeah. uh, write like this you cannot generalize so yeah. you can add uh, those uh, points also okay yeah yeah thank you sir so what can Any i question? make one last uh, quick comment yeah 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 uh, apart from the you know surface meaning of this sin and talk if my uh, friend presenters can have a look on the you know discourse or the you know underlining meaning when yeah. it occurs with the bhavruta uh, like aicha thoke aicha singe so uh, these two give the surface meaning in the same way but when we look into the underlying you know meaning uh, one thing i can you know observe is that it, i may be uh, wrong also if i am not very happy like you know i'm not very happy because of some reason then if i'm asked to say something that in that case i can say aicha thoke something like that you know with an emphasize and the another one is uh, sasinge that is in another you know situation so yeah. it will be you know uh, very good if you can have a look in that area as well so that's yeah 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 from my end thank yeah, yeah. you yeah we welcome uh, your uh, variable suggestions and queries from the participants and other and the teachers scholars because uh, we want to make a clear that idea about the sin and talk and we are the work on children talk is not preliminary work but our work is preliminary children talk so thank you okay. for your uh, very good thank you uh, i think the time is over for this session so uh, this uh, paper so uh, thank you pritam and kenny thank you sir okay, okay. let us uh, so we can stop our yeah yeah uh, you okay. can stop uh, let us go to next presenter Ellen Parker semantic split in northern naga yes. lexical disambiguations in sort of partial sound sense in polysemes please uh, thank you, and my apologies for the lengthy title on this one. Um, right, so uh, today I want to talk about polysemy and um, some splits that are happening in Northern Naga. Um, and actually, probably these are happening in Bodogaro and Jingpo as well, but have not been addressed directly. Uh, to give a little bit of context about why this is happening, or rather why I'm looking at this topic, is um, I'm currently undertaking a fairly large uh, project here at Zurich, which is a Bayesian phylogeny of all of the SAW languages. Uh, if you're familiar with the Saga et al. 2019 paper, the dated language phylogenies, something, something, shed new light on Sino-Tibetan, um, probably a paper that you've seen. Um, we're using basically the exact same Bayesian statistical methods, but with a much, much, much larger uh, data corpus and trying to cover every single SAW variety that there is. So this includes all of Bodogaro, Jingpo, Sak, uh, Northern Naga. Um, in order to do this, however, we have to put considerable amount of time into determining uh, cognate sets and, and making sure that we have clear um, sort of historical reconstructions that we can base these cognate judgments on and make sure that the semantics are clear. And we do have a few historical reconstructions. So Joseph and Berling for Protoborogaro, for example, uh, which is all right in certain areas, but is a little bit lacking in others. We have Huziwara's proto Lewish, which is great. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Walter French's Proto-Northern Naga, which is 1983 and quite problematic, but by no fault of his own. Um, so this is something that we're basically, or rather I, and for the most part, I'm trying to clarify. And so I'm looking at a tremendous amount of data. Um, today's talk is going to focus primarily on what is typically called Northern Naga. 
Um, but if you have similar thoughts about this stuff elsewhere for Bodogaro or Jingfo Osaki, and please let me know. Um, I hate the name Northern Naga. I think it is linguistically unhelpful. Uh, Northern Naga is not demonstrably closely related to the other so-called Naga languages. Um, I've given a horrible, horrible oversimplification here in the tree on the bottom. Please see Sahani's talk tomorrow about the uh, Angami Pochuri clade for uh, a better explanation of this. But the point here is rather just to show you Northern Naga does not actually align in the same clade. We cannot say that there is a monophyletic Naga clade in this sense. Um, so yeah, and, and so where is this spoken? So this is basically, this outlined area is the general area where these languages are spoken. Uh, it's sort of from the border of Nagaland and a little bit inside Nagaland as well, all the way up basically to Vijinagar, uh, as well as in Myanmar and in, in Arunachal Pradesh. A more linguistically appropriate name really than would be Central Sol. This is what I tend to call it. This is probably what I will end up calling it throughout the course of this talk. Uh, Northern Sol has also been proposed by Post and Berling. Um, although uh, in this sense, I think Central Sol is probably a little bit better, but Northern, Northern Sol is another option. It's also the most diverse branch within Sol. So compared to Bodogaro and Jingfo and we have um, at least sort of uh, intuitively a much larger set of individual mutually unintelligible varieties that are spoken. Uh, we have at least three sort of major groups within this, which is Wancho Konyak Pom Chang Chan Karyo. We have Kam Yung in Lainong Pong Yom Macham as another sort of branch. And then we have um, the sort of Tang Sa Nokte Tutsa Olo kind of branch, which includes uh, those languages as well, uh, obviously, but then also things like um, Konu and a few other varieties that sometimes are grouped there, but sometimes not. Altogether, we're looking at data um, today for this talk from 130, we're not actually looking at all 130 different uh, Northern Naga varieties, but data has been considered for this many varieties for what I'm going to show you. Um, and that also includes the number for the larger study, as well as about 50 Doculux for Bodogaro, Jingfo, and Sok languages. Uh, you can sort of see the discrepancy here that we have 130 for Northern Naga for Central Sol, but not that many even for all of Bodogaro and Jingpo combined. This is sort of just an indication of the uh, linguistic diversity that we see in this um, Central Sol Northern Naga group. Um, right, so we're talking about polysemy. So what is polysemy? Polysemy is something that you certainly have in any of the languages that you work on. This is something where you have two things that we might translate into two words right in English. Um, for example, lick and flame, but which actually come from a single etymological root. We have, for example, in Northern Naga, this Leung uh, stem that is probably actually also where one of the stems for white comes from. Lick and flame um, collexify quite frequently in Sino-Tibetan. You will see a lot of historical reconstructions that consider this really as one term. And in fact, even in English, we talk about the flames licking the bottom of the pot, right? When cooking, uh, hand and leaf, right? Dak, lak, jak, some word like this probably you have. Um, and often this is a, a very common collectification as well. This would count as polysemy. Something that would not be polysemous, but would rather just be homophony would be something like look, long, and uh, hawk, eagle, kite, raptor, bird of prey, long, uh, and maybe sort of a folk etymology as well. Hawks are famous for seeing well, so maybe these are connected, but in fact, we can reconstruct these as quite distinct stems. So this would just be a case of, of homophony and not polysemy. We also find a lot of the same senses, a lot of the same meanings of polysemous words across families in the region. So Mashaung, which is part of this Tungsa Nokte group, uh, is a tibeto burman language. They have a word uh, kwap, and kwap means to infect, to stick to something, but also to perch, right? Like a woodpecker or a cicada on a tree. In Fake, which is a Thai language uh, spoken sort of in Eastern Tinsukia, Thai Fake also has this word chap, and chap in Thai Fake has exactly these same three meanings uh, and a few others, right? It sort of expanded its semantic scope. Um, so it's really not so uncommon to find these kinds of similarities. And uh, in this case, this is probably not a borrowing. It's just coincidence that they sort of have low back vowels in a final P. Um, but it's very unlikely that this is actually a borrowing just because of how widespread this is elsewhere in, in languages. Um, yeah, and this sort of collexification is something that really is very widespread. You can imagine uh, words for sun, day, 
um, sky, uh, which often have this sort of night, uh, night, or even just like words for today or days of the week, you'll see this kind of night thing a lot, uh, corresponding to the sun and to the sky. And especially if you go into like, um, Jaronic, like, um, Guillaume Jacques was talking about yesterday, you find a lot of in that area in Southwest China, you find a lot of these as well. These uh, polysemous stems are also sort of, uh, in a few cases, undergoing a semantic split. So you have a lot of cases where you would have two words which are polysemous. For example, we could see lick and flame, just as an example, uh, where you could imagine that they are currently pronounced the same, but we're starting to see sort of a divergence in the phonology of this. And it is occurring throughout all of Central Sol. Um, you'll find it in every, every sort of branch, every clade of central sol, but it's not occurring uniformly across the varieties. The reason that these splits are happening, or at least one of the results of these splits, is that it's uh, resulting in an increase in complexity of meaning. And this often sort of disambiguates things, not because they need to be disambiguated. And I'll show you a couple examples where the meaning is quite clearly distinct between the two just from context, but it is still providing some sort of disambiguation. Um, and it's, it's also not replacing stems, which is really significant. It's not like, for example, uh, borrowing another word from the neighboring language because that's a common commerce word or material culture word or something like this, but it's actually just adding sort of shades of meaning. Um, and again, this is not unique to these uh, Central Sol Northern Naga languages. So let's look at just a few examples here, not so many. Uh, one of them is this word rap and rap is my reconstruction for the Central Sol Northern Naga branch. Uh, chances are for shoot, like shoot a gun, or to kick, um, not kick like a tree, but kick something that would propel it, you likely have a word similar to this in your own languages. Uh, and what we're seeing is actually that these are the same stem. These are polysemous, and in the vast majority of Tangsanokte languages, which is where these examples are coming from, these words are absolutely identical. And they're identical as well as following really predictable sort of sound change patterns. So in Cholim and Longri, for example, this G initial turns into a G, G sound, whereas in Jahi, Cham Chang, and Shichu, uh, it turns into an H sound. And um, it should be mentioned that Jahi, Cham Chang, and Shichu are closely related to each other, but Cholim and Longri are also incredibly closely related, such that in the 1930s, their villages were a two minute walk and had a single village head between the two villages, right? They're, they're very high level of mutual intelligibility. What's weird though, is that Cholim has completely changed the onset for kick and all of them have changed the vowel for kick. Um, the shoot form in these cases, uh, actually, sorry, Jahi, Chang, Chang, and Shechu, the vowel for shoot is sort of the quote, incorrect vowel. Uh, it's the hop version, which does reconstruct to the original stem. So in this case, shoot is the word that is changed, whereas in Cholim and Longri, kick has changed, but not in the same way as each other, which is quite strange. We would expect that they would change in fairly similar ways. Um, and again, it's not limited to Tangsanokte, even though those examples were from. So in Konyak and Wancho, we also see sort of a discrepancy between these two stems. Uh, this is um, Berling and Wangsu's um, Wancho list, which is not the Wancho of like uh, Kamhwa Noknu. Um, those of you who know Ban Wang Losu, this is not his Wancho. This is sort of a lower Wancho, uh, closer to uh, Sipskar. Um, yeah, and these splits are not limited just to one subbranch of Sol. Uh, they are, however, only attested in a very small minority of varieties overall. Out of these 130 uh, Central Sol Northern Naga languages that I'm looking at, or Doculex that I'm looking at, even for something like Kick Shoot, there's maybe like five. I, in fact, I'm showing you basically all of the examples for Rap from my data set. Uh, so they're very, very rare. Uh, overall, but they're also not so rare as far as something that's occurring. They're very rare for an individual word, but they're not rare as a phenomenon. Additionally, we cannot reconstruct two different stems, right? You could So you could look at this and say, well, clearly this is a split that happened sometime long ago. There's two different stems for this, but in fact, for Northern Naga, for Central Sol, we cannot reconstruct two different stems. Uh, this only reconstructs to a single stem with something then like hip being a, uh, an exception to what are otherwise very regular sound change rules. Another example, this is only in Mashang, uh, Mosang Tangsa. Uh, Mosang is the, uh, at least from conventional wisdom, Mosang is the largest of the Tangsa varieties uh, as far as the India population is concerned with around two to 3,000 speakers uh, if, if, if people's self-reporting is accurate. Um, this has undergone a shift just with this one word here, Kung. And so Kung means clear, but initially it was just clear in general, uh, meaning uncluttered. 
And now it has undergone a split where we have kung as a third tone that just means clear of the sky and kung, meaning clear of water. And this is also a really salient kind of change. This isn't just, you know, some dumb foreign linguist like myself has gone through and transcribed this incorrectly. This is actually something where it's really clear and salient among speakers. Multiple speakers confirm it. And the difference in tone isn't just one of pitch, but also one of phonation and duration. So it's very like measurably distinct in this case. Um, Moshaung is the only variety where I found the specific split occurring, but Moshaung is also kind of um, prone to these kinds of changes uh, and phonological changes that other very closely related varieties or not. Mashang does a lot of weird phonological innovation stuff. Uh, another one that you may have in your language is this low stem that I've reconstructed. This is uh, Proto-Tibetan is low here, um, meaning tall, long, far, uh, high. It has all sorts of this very sort of broad range of, of meanings. And in most varieties of uh, Northern Naga, this will be something like Lu or Lu or something where, where all four of these meanings are the same form. In Lainong, however, which is a variety or a small group of varieties spoken in Myanmar, um, you have long is always lai and tall is always lam, except for those varieties spoken directly around the Lahe township area. Uh, Lahe is sort of one of the bigger population centers in the Northern Naga area in Myanmar. However, in Tang Sanokte, uh, which this Rinku Shangwa Lungkai examples are showing, we have another tone category shift. So we've gone from Lu, which is this first tone one on the right, which has been retained as far in these varieties. However, tall has turned into a fourth tone word, Lu. Um, and in this case, it's happening again quite consistently. See, this is a difference in segment and in duration and in pitch for all three of these varieties. So it truly is a switch in tone category and not just sort of they're closing their glottis a little too much at the end. Uh, Ninxiao, which is another one of these varieties, also has this nasal uh, coda, except in this case, long is the word with the nasal coda and far has uh, no nasal coda. Um, this letter D here, this uh, dong du is cognate with the L's, just initial L's have turned into D's in this variety. So this is still the same, the same edema. Dai, meaning egg, is another example. Well, egg actually water slash juice, but of course, in many varieties of Northeastern languages, the word for egg uh, is generally chicken plus this, this water uh, or juice stem. Um, this has changed now in Asen and Yatsawa, which again is really interesting because Asen and Yatsawa are really, really, really similar to each other. Very high degree of mutual intelligibility. They form their own clade within sort of Northern Naga, um, but part of the Tang Sunokde group. Meanwhile, in Chang, Tian, which are different languages despite the similarity in names, Chang, Tian, and Wancho, um, these terms are the same. Water and egg are still absolutely homophonous, right? Um, however, uh, and sorry, and Atsei Nyatsawa is spoken in this little red circle. It is, it is actually probably, um, I would say, impressionistically at least, it is the most divergent of the uh, Tangsa Nokte varieties. It's very, very similar to some other sort of other Northern Naga varieties nearby. Um, you'll notice, however, I've only given you five varieties here. That's because in most varieties of Northern Naga, the water uh, stem, Tai, has been replaced either with something like Zhung, Zhu, or with Kam. And um, Kam itself is actually probably also derived from another stem, which I'll talk about in a couple slides. Uh, but again, this is a case where this would actually be a case where a term is replacing another term. So Kam has replaced Tai in these languages, whereas in these cases, uh, it has been retained both for the water meaning and the egg meaning. Um, yeah, the other thing is that for the varieties which have retained Tai for egg, which is well, it's all of them, basically. Um, Thai is starting to show phonological shifts that are not really um, consistent with what you would expect for a T onset. So Thai becoming Tsai is really quite typical, and it's happening quite frequently when it's not happening on other T initial words to the same degree. And this is probably actually where Asain C comes from. It was probably T C C, right? Uh, whereas on the water sense, it's retained this D onset. Uh, and of course, this, this Thai, is, as everybody probably knows, is the first syllable of nearly every river name in the Northeast, right? Dibru, Dihim, Disang is this sort of water stem, sort of uh, widely documented as being the case. 
Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of rushing through this because I feel like I had too many slides and too many things to say. So apologies if I stop too early, but I don't think I will. Um, yeah, so let's look at some of the explanations for why this is happening. One of these uh, things that is one of the things that I think is a very strong driving factor here is a complexification of the lexicon. And maybe we can attribute this not to contact with languages like Assamese and Hindi and Burmese and Nagamese and Chinese and so on and so forth. Um, but rather due to sort of uh, young speakers growing up being aware of sort of uh, nuance and meaning that they may not feel they can easily have. There was this great discussion yesterday about the um, sort of idiophones and how this is one of these things that really should be retained to maintain uh, the sort of depth and complexity of the languages. And this is certainly true in Northern Naga as well. Um, that resonated really well with me because we have all of these sort of echo formations and idiophones and, and, and really cool stuff. But again, younger speakers aren't hearing it. So a younger speaker is saying, well, you know, we have this word that we're using for green and for yellow or for red and for yellow, depending on the language. Um, however, you know, we're encountering yellow as existing in, in Hindi and all these other languages. And so what we're seeing is actually an explosion of what would otherwise be basic color terms and different strategies that different language communities are using, whether it's it's Nodi or Kotmein or Haldi Rong or some native thing, Zhung borrowed from another close language. Uh, we see the same with blue as well. There's like five or six different strategies that these language communities are using for um, sort of uh, reappropriating stems that already existed. Like for example, Sim, Sim, most people probably know, I think in Bodogaro, Sim is still pretty common as black, um, but it's, it's basically been lost in Tangsanokte. And so it's being reappropriated to mean blue in a lot of these varieties. Um, I bring up the color term simply by analogy. Uh, this is something that is clearly happening. This is something that I've, I've spoken on before and spoken to a few of you in person about before. And I think this is some of the same motivation for why we're seeing these kinds of uh, semantic splits with polysemous stems. Um, yeah. The other thing is that we can understand some of the sound changes just through analogous sound changes that we see elsewhere in these languages. So for example, in the case of Lao, somebody's drawing on my screen, in the case of Lao, uh, Lao, which is first tone turning into a glottal stop, actually we see this happening all the time in varieties like Cholim and Rira, uh, where the proto creaky tone, instead of becoming low and creaky, has become high and with a glottal stop. And so there is sort of clear um, analogous sound changes happening in closely related languages. Um, finally, in the case of, of near, uh, sorry, of far and tall and long, where we have this nasal coda, I think probably actually what we're seeing here is a separate stem that's just too poorly attested to say anything about. So in Shangval, in Hacheng, we have liang lu, meaning long, tall, far, and it's sort of this compound, and it's probably this liang, which is causing, right? So liang is probably being used for far, and lu is being used for tall, for example, or something to this extent. Um, why does this matter? Well, one reason that this matters is because if we're going to try to be able to tell the history of these languages and understand how these languages are, are related to each other, I mean, I think everybody here would agree that all of the languages that we're working on do share some point of common ancestry or else we wouldn't be considering them Tibeto-Burman, right? Um, if we're able to understand how these sound changes have happened, how the semantic splits have happened, how mergers have happened, how replacements have happened, then we can really sort of um, better understand the development of the languages in in total. And for me personally, one of the things I really want to be able to do is place these things in time and space. My sort of long-term goal is to be have this have this really nice historical map that actually can show migration patterns and things like this and traditional villages. And, um, uh, uh, you know, this is something that I've worked on a lot as well is these, these very old 1920s and 1890s maps of the region. And if we can combine all of this data, then I think that really is uh, going to be quite informative. We can also, um, I don't want to say make predictions because as you know, as linguists, we generally shouldn't be predicting things. So this is not a prediction to be very clear, but we can sort of guess where we might see some future splits. Um, in some cases, we have a lot of compounds. So for example, there's bird names, right? So Vuro is the, uh, the hornbill. And this is a, a compound of bird and bone because it's got its bone on its head. We could imagine at some point semantic bleaching of this bone stem, in which case maybe it's no longer apparent that it's coming from bone. Uh, this is probably actually what happened with cum for water is we probably just had this Thai water stem, which became cum Thai for drinking water because it was water that you had boiled and therefore it's, it's quite safe to drink. And then Thai gets dropped. 
um, because it's taken as a suffix or something else. And so cum shows up. And cum is also the word in a lot of these uh, varieties for distilled alcohol as opposed to rice beer, right? Uh, the sort of lauhu of, of alcohol. Um, so probably cases where we have things that are already compounds and are frequently used as compounds, we can imagine those sort of reducing in a set. Um, we also have a lot of uh, onsets in the uh, correspondence set, which are really unstable. So aspirated TS or CH or things like this tend to be really unstable and um, diverge quite easily between uh, reflexes in, in modern languages. Um, we can expect that sort of thing as well. So R is another onset, which has been quite variable. The R, G um, set. So for example, Sky is Gang or Rang or Zang, depending on which Wancho cognac variety you're looking at. Um, this is another very unstable segment. So we can expect that kind of instability would do it as well. And the third case is things like difficult, rough, rar versus smooth, easy, hal, um, which simply, again, by looking at analogy in English, we can already see these kinds of things. So we might describe a piece of meat as tough. We might describe a situation as tough. And if you asked an English speaker, um, is this the same word, the same meaning? Generally, they would think about it for half of a second and say yes. But as we're just going out and sort of speaking this as, as, as a native language, this is not something that we're really thinking of and aware of. Same as like, oh, how did your, you know, you had this thing last night, how did it go? It went very smoothly, as opposed to, you know, the table's very smooth. Yes, we are aware of this connection, but at the time of producing speech, I would guess that generally most people are not. So I would expect a similar kind of um, split as a possibility in areas like this. So that's all I've got. Thank you very much. Um, if you are working on any languages in particular, all languages in particular, some of these uh, underdescribed Bodogaro varieties, please get in touch. I would love to chat with you more about this. It's very hard to find things that are not Argatala uh, or like standard varieties. Uh, so we'd love to chat. Thank you. Thank you, Galen, for your wonderful presentation. As well as uh, it's a really very interesting area of study. Now uh, it's open for question hour. May I ask one question? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, on one slide, I was uh, uh, curious about the form of T T E I. It meant water as well as egg. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. What could be the explanation? Uh, because, well, it's also juice. So water is probably, I, I'm saying water as a kind of a shorthand, but it's really water juice kind of that range of thick liquids. Uh, and this is something that is generally proposed. Uh, Matasoff, uh, for his reconstruction of proto tibeto burman offers this as well, um, that it's bird water because the egg the, is the liquid that you're getting from the bird, right? Uh, obviously, other than blood, if that were something that you're using as well for a food source. But is that your question? What's yes, what's that, the basis uh, for? Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. Interesting mm -hmm. explanation. Yeah, this, and, uh, and we I find this it, as well. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Please, you continue. I was just going to say we find this as well. So there's there's a um, un, undescribed language in northeastern Manipur that a colleague of mine works on, and she has found the same construction where it's quite transparently, you know, bird juice for egg. And and I'm sure other people here would have examples um, in Bodokaro, I believe as well. This is fairly common, though. Actually, I should double check that before I say it out loud. Uh, I think as far as I remember, in Kokoro, they also means blood. Yeah, this is another blood is blood is tough. <laughs> blood is difficult um, because blood is one of these stems that is really, really sort of irregular in how it's developed in different varieties. Blood has given me hours of headaches of just trying to come up with what the actual reconstruction would be. It is quite possible that um, blood has come from this same stem in Kokbrok in this case. Um, Although actually, so there is uh, chi and ti and ti I'm seeing and tui in different uh, Borogara languages as well. Yes. That would be the egg word. So if you have chi for egg and you have something like the for blood, then those are almost certainly two different stems because there was a tsi tsi kind of uh, stem for blood that has undergone a lot of 
crazy changes. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. I'm going to look into that, though. Can I, can uh, I say can something? Please look into the chat box. I think there is some observation in the chat box. Uh, yeah, sorry. I can't see the chat box because I'm sharing. Um, give me one second. There it is. Yeah, in Dimasa, yeah, water is D and blood is the. I would assume that these may very well be unrelated, but I would need to look into it, which is another reason that I'm, I'm sort of um, asking people to get in touch if you speak something um, that is Bodogaro that is not one of the standard varieties, because actually one of the biggest issues in reconstructions for Bodogaro is that if we only have the sort of standard varieties, then it becomes very hard to do reconstructions because we've lost a lot of these sorts of things. And I think that, you know, Joseph and Berling did really good work, but one of the issues is that it only offers um, a very sort of abstract reconstruction of the stems and we lose a lot of data. So if if there are people here who speak these varieties or work on these varieties, I would love to chat with you and sort of compare notes so that we can improve on, on what we're doing here. Um, I just want to ask uh, regarding that um, rule that you have uh, framed for the becoming tsa, um, is that environment only when it is followed by the E vowel sound or does it also? No, yeah. Um, this is, I, I meant to mention this in my talk, but you know, there's, so there's the neo-grammarian hypothesis where sound changes are really regular and, and happen in consistent environments. Um, they, that, I mean, that's generally been disproven, but it's still kind of useful to talk about. In the case of egg, it's really, really, really common on egg, but it's quite uncommon on grandfather, which I also reconstruct as dai. So nobody talks about their grandfather as tsai, but eggs are often tsai. And in fact, the people who say tsai, um, at least in the communities where there is a dialectal split for a single variety. So in the Mashang variety, for example, Mashang is spoken on um, the very headwaters of, of what becomes the Namchik River. If you grew up west of the river, then you pronounce it tsai. And if you grew up east of the river, you pronounce it tai. And the people who say tai kind of tease the people that say tsai. So it's a very marked pronunciation even. And, and it's happening on egg, but it's not happening on grandfather. So I think, I think in this case, it might just be, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good, there's no clear conditioning for it. That is a really good question. That's a good point. We would expect that kind of palatalization, right? Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's actually even more restricted in that it's largely just uh, tiger does it as well. So you'll see cha for tiger having a lot of variability, this kind of African onset. Um, the, I can't remember what else. There's like three or four words and egg is egg and tiger and, and a couple more that really have very irregular things where even within a single variety, you can't just write a rule like this that explains what it is for that variety. It's actually just for that word, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That is quite interesting because in Dimasa it changes for every other word, um, mm. having the e vowel, I mean, following it. So whether it's an egg or I mean, it, of course it's d. So mm. whether it's it's a, uh, whether it's an uncle or whether it's a gravy or whether it's um, egg or water, anything, it just becomes z. Da becomes right. Da. Yeah. Da da becomes da. So um, it's quite interesting that in uh, these languages that you have um, excited here, um, it's actually specifically for, uh, you know, and they're restricted for eggs and the like. So quite interesting. Yeah, there, well, there are varieties where it's more general. I mean, there, there certainly are cases. I, off the top of my head, can't recall what they are because I'm looking at, you know, 180 <laughs> varieties for this. But there are varieties where it is more frequent. Um, but in those cases, then it's quite easy to do the reconstruction uh, egg three is another one. So three, which I would reconstruct as zam, could be tsam or sam or sim or three is one, another one of those words that is just, maybe it's just because of the frequency and the fact that it shows up in compounds so often. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a few specific words that are really troublesome for this. I would, I would be really curious. I, um, I have Dimasa in my sample, but um, not... Oh, actually, the I have um, Francois Jacquesson's uh, Dimasa and, um, you know, that Asami's website, Hobdo, that's the dictionary. That's sort of my Dimasa data set. So I'd be quite interested to get different data on Dimasa and look into that better. Mm -hmm. Actually, it occurs only in the Hashao dialect, not in the other varieties. 
So maybe yeah. that may be the reason why um, you could not find it. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's, I mean, that's the other thing, right? So I'm, I'm really trying hard to get these, these sort of not non-standard, right? I'm in scare quotes, these non-standard dialects, because those are the ones that are actually most informative about the re reconstructions and the, the way that the sound patterns have changed. If you, all you have are standard forms, then you end up with a very sort of diluted, washed out kind of thing, right? So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, Carolyn has uh, one question. Yes, yes yeah. yeah, I yeah. just I just want to I just wanted to uh, to point out that uh, the original word for blood is C S I C. Yeah, and, uh, mm -hmm. this word uh, C, you know, it has uh, like we even even we people we are not aware because we don't uh, it, it doesn't uh, exist as a as an independent is an independent word. It is suffixed right. to words. Yeah. It is suffixed to words such as compound, compound word. Um, I mean, uh, like, uh, so it will be gung si, gung si. Gung means uh, mm -hmm. nose and si is what, uh, blood. That means uh, right. the blood, the nose bleeding is called gung si yunga, gung si yunga. Gung si, it's, it's, a, it's a noun. Yeah, and, and there's, um, I, I saw Niharika was in here a moment ago. I'm not sure if she still is. One of the languages she works on, right? You have Sivat. Sivat is for leech, and the C is definitely coming from this blood word as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually have two stems that I've reconstructed. So I have C and R with a R, like a velar fricative for blood, because it does look like at some point much earlier there was a split there. But yes, it definitely is. It should be C, would be my expectation. Mm -hmm. And then However, the S onset has undergone fortition in a number of varieties and become T or something like this. So yeah, it's mm. it's um yeah, it's complicated. I I'd really appreciate that. That's that's mm. good. Thank you. Wang mm. Mit. Mm. Uh okay. Uh thank you for this time. Uh when I was listening to this Keller Parker, his presentations, I could relate to my language, Nokte, uh, which is one mm. of the it's called a Hava Nokte, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. because we have a four or five uh, varieties here. So I could see like when you were talking about like uh, there's a homophonous uh, word, you have like, for example, shoot and kick. So we yes. have like uh, for shoot, it's a half, also for the kick, half of one variety. It's not all for nocte. And also right. when you're talking about this tall and far, there is a similar like what we have for tall, we have low. Also for the far, we have low. But for mm. deep, deep, it is a loop. Yeah, deep. yeah, that deep. Yeah, deep was another one ah, that I didn't. Deep, include, and, I wanted, yeah. Yeah. and then, although it's a, for water, we have a joe, but egg, yep. we have a tea. But very similar to this egg, we have uh, the you know, liquid part like soup, for example, soup mm -hmm. can be a yep. tea. So, egg and right. that, that those things I could, you know, observe some kind of similarity. So interesting. So, we can, you know, further expand the ideas later part with you. On yeah, the, and Yes. Uh, so Hava Nokte, Nokte is one that I've also looked at and I've, I've spent some time in, in the villages. Um, reach out to me. Let's, let's which, chat Which about village? This. Which village? By the way? Uh, so I was in, uh, well, it had two different names. It had Nasumi's name and it had uh, Paltan Basti near um, Tipan. Oh, okay, okay. 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 Uh, I, I spent some time in there and then um, uh, Iftikar Rahman, who you may know, uh, I've worked with him. Iftikar, well. Iftikar, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, so Iftikhar and I have chatted a lot about data sets, um, but yeah, let's, let's uh, reach out. I'm actually, I don't want to put this on YouTube, but I'll put my WhatsApp in chat. Um, and if anybody sort of wants to chat about this or reach out or, or, you know, get involved, then I would love uh, to chat. Okay. Thank you. And that's what yeah. my observation. Thank you. Wang Lit. Uh, let's uh, have last question. Anybody? Thank you for the other examples in chat as well. And and it's interesting to see Uipo has this Jui, which actually sort of matches the stem that we now use for water in Tangsa and Nukte and that area. I think there is no uh, further questions. So thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Ellen, wonderful uh, topic as well as wonderful presentation and discussion also. So uh, let me hand over to uh, Tiblani committee. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
all the part, all the paper presenters. Uh, at the first place, I'm very thankful to Dr. Leharomam Sarvajit for during this session very smoothly. And we have a very fruitful discussion over this session as well. So once again, I thank all the paper presenters of this session. So uh, with this note, we close uh, this session and there is some other announcement from Monali. Over to you, Monali. Um, thank you, Bijin. It was a very productive session and we had so many in interesting presentations um, and discussion as well. Um, I just want to make an announcement that the next session will start at um, 3 30 p.m. IST, of course, with a few uh, with some changes. Um, the first presenter, um, ZD Lalmangai Zauva, has cancelled his paper. So, in place of that, uh, there will be another presentation from the last session. The last session has been cancelled. That is uh, from 6.30 to 8 p.m. IST, that session has been canceled because two of the paper presenters uh, are un unable to access um, the computer for some reasons. So the presenter of the last session, the first present. Uh, hello, Manali. Okay, it may be some internet issue with the Monal. Yeah, she was trying to say that uh, today's last session, in session number four, first speaker, uh, no, the second speaker, Rinki, and the uh, third speaker, Hemilan, they drop from the presentation. So in this session, we have only one speaker who is the Rotnozoi Liang. Yes, we don't have uh, first speaker of the session number three, it's going to be start by 3.30. So in place of that the Lanhamang Duba, it will be uh, Ratnojoy Riyan. So there will be no session uh, as of today. The session number four has been canceled. So the only one speaker of that session has been shifted as the first speaker of the session number three. I think it was the information that she was trying to convey to us. Monali, you're back, yes. Yeah, sorry, I had to connect my hotspot. Um, I was connecting Wi-Fi, so for which um, there was no light suddenly, so I got disconnected. Yeah, that is what I was saying. Ratnanjoy Riyang will be the first presenter of the next session, and the next session will be the last session. So session four has been cancelled. That is mm -hmm. all that we wanted to inform, and Wang Lit will chair the session. Mm -hmm. So uh, our Zoom link will remain here. We are not going to end the meeting. You can uh, just um, be here, and you can mute and turn the video off and just take a break uh, because it's the same Zoom link in any way. I'll just end the live session and um, 